Hi, I'm Betsy Beck with the Kramer Racing Law Firm. Today is Thursday, February 13, 2020. I'm here today to introduce and interview John Thomas Johnson Jr., a longtime member of the bar and partner at Kramer Racing. I'm honored to do it because I've known him literally my entire life. He happens to be my father. Uh, but for today's introduction, I'm, I'm proud to introduce, introduce him to you as a true trial lawyer uh, and longtime member of the Knoxville Bar. Give us your full name and date of birth. Well, my full name is John Thomas Johnson, Jr. Date of birth, September 5th, 1949. On the letterhead, I'm shown as John T. Johnson, Jr. And uh, when letters are sent out under my name, they type in John T. Johnson, Jr. and I sign them Tom Johnson. And of course, as you can imagine, that's created a lot of confusion over the years. And we uh, did the same with you when we named you Deborah Elizabeth Johnson and called you Betsy. I'm, I'm familiar with the struggle. Uh, as, a, as a junior, that leads me to ask you about your parents and their backgrounds. Well, my father's name was John Thomas Johnson. He went by J.T. Johnson. Some folks called him J. Johnson. My mother was Mary Jo Law, L.A.W., and uh, she and my dad married in 1948. Okay. And tell us about your siblings. I have one brother, Harold, who was a uh, mechanical engineer at TVA, and he's now retired. My uh, sister, Mary, works for Upperman High School in the central office there. And my youngest sister, Helen Daniels, works for Zimmer Broadcasting, which is a broadcasting company in Cookville that has three or four uh, radio stations under the umbrella. Tell us some about your hometown and what it was like to grow up there. Well, I grew up in Baxter, Tennessee, which is eight miles west of Cookville. Uh, it was and still is a very small town, and uh, there wasn't much mischief you could get into, even if you wanted to. Uh, there was an exit on the interstate, the Baxter-Gainsboro exit. Uh, everyone knew everyone else. If you were inclined to get into mischief, of course, the word got back to your parents before you could even get home. But it was a great, great place to grow up. And tell me about your high school. I went to Upperman High School, which is the high school there in Baxter. Before 1959, it was called Baxter Seminary, and it was a private slash public high school for students in the western end of Putnam County. And in 1959, it officially became Upperman High School. And I uh, started there, uh, I believe, in 1962. And all your family went there? Every one of us. Now, my father attended when it was Baxter Seminary, and my mother attended when it was Baxter Seminary. My mother uh, was an orphan and lived at the Masonic home. It was a, an orphan home in Nashville. And somehow, uh, they sent her to Baxter to attend Baxter Seminary. And at that time, there were public students, but there were also private students from even other countries. And they had uh, dormitories, and, uh, but all that changed when it became a public high school. And in high school, what activities were you involved in? I played sports. Uh, of course, at that time, we only had two men's sports, basketball and football. In fact, the year before I started high school, they didn't even have enough players to field a football team, so there was no football team at all. Uh, but they resumed play the next year, and I played football for three years. Not very well. I weighed 125 pounds. And, uh, but I played basketball all four years and was captain or co-captain in my senior year. We actually had a pretty good basketball team when I was a senior. What was your plan after you finished high school? Well, I knew I wanted to go to college. I was a good student, and uh, there was no question but that I was going to go to college. Um, I considered the Air Force Academy, but my eyesight prohibited that. Uh, the next bright idea I had was to go to the University of North Dakota. And uh, the reason for that was I thought I wanted long winters and a lot of snow. 
I actually sent off for a catalog from University of North Dakota and when my parents found out about it they thought that was pretty silly and uh, uh, since they were going to be paying for my education they thought Tennessee Tech was a wiser choice so I entered Tennessee Tech in the fall of 1967. And because I know you well I'm going to ask you to tell us at the time you went off to college what the extent was of your diet and food choices. I pretty much existed on peanut butter and jelly uh, plus grilled cheese. Um, an occasional fish stick here or there but that was I was pretty picky eater and didn't didn't have much of an appetite. Although I later regretted that because my mother was a fantastic cook and when I think about all the good food I miss for those years it, it makes me ill. When you were at Tennessee Tech, did you know you wanted to be an attorney? I had no earthly idea. I, uh, in high school, I took a bookkeeping course, which I enjoyed, and so that led me to consider accounting, and that's what I majored in. And I did well, I made good grades, but as I neared uh, my final year, I began to realize that you know, this is not actually all that interesting. And um, also began to interview, and I, at that time I think there were the big seven accounting firms, and jobs were not plentiful, uh, the job prospects were bleak, and I had no interest really in being an accountant. So then I began to think about, well, what could I possibly do? And I really didn't have much of an idea. I considered pharmacy, but I had no background in, uh, in any of the sciences, either in high school or college, so um, I began to think about law school, although I didn't know any lawyers, uh, had no friends who were lawyers. My uncle, Uncle uh, Lewis Johnson, was the dean of the College of Business at Tennessee Tech, and he had a law degree. So I went in one day and I said, Uncle Lewis, I hear that if you go to law school that you have to uh, study um, maybe five, six, seven hours outside the classroom. Is that true? And he assured me that it was and so I sort of uh, passed on the idea of law school at that point but as the spring quarter uh, commenced I knew I had to do something and so one day I was standing, uh, I lived in a fraternity house and I was standing there shaving one of my roommates walked by, and this roommate was Bill Ray, who was my lifelong friend. He passed away a few years ago. But as he walked by, I said, you know what, I think I'm going to go to law school. And his reply was, well, I just may go with you. And that's the extent of uh, forethought that we put in going to law school. And in fact, he did go with He you. did go to law school with me. We were roommates uh, the entire time. We started in the... Uh, of course, that back then we were on the summer of uh, the quarter system, and we started in the summer of 1971, and uh, I graduated in August of 73. He took one quarter longer to graduate because he had a uh, an illness that that kept him out of school one quarter. Well, tell us about law school and what you remember the most about it. Well, as I said, I knew nothing about the law whatsoever. Um, but the first day we had these orientation sessions, we were given assignments, we were told which books to buy, went to the bookstore, purchased all the books, went back to our luxurious apartment off of Sutherland Avenue, um, and I sat down in the recliner and began to do the first assignments. And it, it was unbelievable to me, uh, but I took an immediate love, or I, I, I knew immediately that I had chosen the right thing. I, I loved law school. Um, the, you know, we did our assignment by briefing cases, and uh, it really impressed me about how you were taught to discard the irrelevant things and concentrate on what was relevant. And law school was absolutely fascinating. I loved it, loved every minute of it. Um, did you enjoy your conversations with professors? Well, 
Um, I had certain political views when I entered law school, but they weren't really all that hard and fixed. But um, in some of the constitutional law classes and criminal law classes, I began to notice that I differed uh, from uh, my professors in terms of uh, you know, what was right and what was wrong and what the courts should be doing, what the courts shouldn't be doing. And we had some pretty lively discussions about that. And my political views sort of hardened while I was in law school. After law school, what was your plan and how did you make your way? Well, I really didn't know, uh, I didn't have much of a plan, honestly. Back then, you didn't have the clerk system as you do now. Uh, at some point in law school, I realized that some of my classmates were actually uh, working part-time or clerking. So I thought, well, that might be a good idea, try to get some practical experience. And I got the phone book out and looked for some attorneys uh, in the neighborhood of where I was living then. Again, that was off Sutherland Avenue. And I found the, the name of an attorney and I called him and went in for an interview and he hired me to, to do some work for him. Um, I don't rem remember much about that experience other than I helped with some sort of post-conviction relief uh, petition. But unfortunately, this attorney uh, passed away not long after I began to work for him. I had a bad uh, tractor incident and, and passed away. And then, uh, and I don't remember how the connection came about, but I met Howard F. Jarvis, who uh, was the father of our late federal judge, James Jarvis. And Mr. Jarvis hired me to uh, clerk for him uh, before before I began working there, Archie Carpenter had worked for Mr. Jarvis, I think, as an associate. So I began to do some uh, clerking for Mr. Jarvis. And of course, Mr. Jarvis is the uncle of the Howard Jarvis who practices with Wolf McLean. And I became great friends with Howard and uh, another nephew of Mr. Jarvis, Dennis Jarvis, who passed away not too long ago. And I became great friends with the Jarvis family. It was, a, it was a good experience. And then after you passed the bar in April of 1974, what were you doing? Well, I was practicing with Mr. Jarvis, and in July of 1974, he sent me to a docket sounding in Anderson County. And I was called uh, out of the courtroom and told that I had an emergency phone call. And I went to the clerk's office. Of course, we had no cell phones in those days. And it was Mr. Jarvis' secretary telling me that Mr. Jarvis had suddenly passed away that morning at the S&W cafeteria. And my response was, you're kidding. She said, no, I'm not kidding. Get back over here. So I did, and it was very unfortunate. Mr. Jarvis uh, was a fine man, and uh, um, I missed out on the opportunity to learn, to learn a lot from him. But that left me um, in his office. He had been by himself only a short period of time. And you know there was some thought that I might be able to continue his practice. But I knew early on that probably was not going to happen. I probably couldn't have found the courthouse, honestly. Um, but Dennis Jarvis, his nephew, uh, worked with me and we worked together on uh, closing out the inventory of Mr. Jarvis's pending cases. Um, and that continued even after I joined uh, the Kramer Law Firm. How did you end up at the Kramer Law Firm after that sudden change of plans? Well, after, um, after it came to me that I was certainly not capable of operating a law office, uh, much less practicing law, that I needed to get a job. So one day I was walking down Gay Street and I walked in or ran into Archie Carpenter. And I asked Archie if he knew of any um, job openings or anyone that I could talk to. And he suggested that I call Andy Johnson, who was an attorney with uh, the Kramer firm. Now, at that point in time, it was Kramer, Johnson, Rayson, Greenwood, and McVeigh. And I liked the idea of having the name Johnson in the firm name. So I called Mr. Johnson, who I did not know, and told him I was looking for a job. 
and uh, he invited me up for an interview. I met with Mr. Johnson and Jack Kramer and some of the others, and they were frank to tell me that they weren't looking for anyone. But within a week or two after the interview, they called me and uh, offered me a job. And I really had no idea at that time what a fantastic opportunity that was. Um, I've, I've talked about being lucky. That wasn't luck. That was God's blessing because it's been a wonderful place to practice law. Well, we're going to talk more about that, but before we do and talk about your life as a lawyer, there were some other things happening in your life about the time you were in, late in law school and early practicing law. One of them involved a young lady I'm familiar with. You are speaking of your mother, Deborah Johnson, my wife of almost 45 years. Um, she went to Tennessee Tech as well. And we probably had been introduced at Tech, but just in passing. Uh, she lived in the honor dorm at Tech and was dating a young man. Um, and I was dating a young lady that lived in the honor dorm. And I would see her in the lobby from time to time. And uh, I was very interested. Uh, but, you know, that's, there was just a brief encounter in college. When I took the law school ad admission test at Vanderbilt, uh, Bill Ray and I went and took it the same day. And a friend of ours, Thelma Askey, uh, took the exam on the same day we did. And Thelma was a student at Tennessee Tech. She didn't start law school when Bill and I did, which was in uh, June of 71, but she started in the fall of 71. And so when I ran into her in the hall, her first quarter, my second quarter, we began to catch up, and I asked her where she was living. Um, she told me on an apartment on 13th Street, and I asked her if she had a roommate. And she said, yes, uh, you may remember uh, Deborah Suits, who also went to Tennessee Tech. And I clearly remember Deborah Suits from Tennessee Tech. So I began calling Deborah to uh, see if she would go out. And I don't know how many calls there were, but she declined each and every time until April of 1972 when there was a big announcement that Elvis Presley would be coming to Stokely for a concert on April the 8th, 1972. And I called her and invited her to the concert and she accepted. And um, the rest is history. Well, and we know now that you've been married a long time. Both of you come from big families, so there was a big wedding, right? Oh, it was a great, uh, huge wedding, uh, full of, uh, it was on the society pages. Actually, there, it was a, an elopement, basically. Uh, our, my friend Bill Ray and his wife Gwen were the only people who were at the wedding. It was a last minute decision to get married. Um, I called around trying to find some minister who would be willing to uh, perform the ceremony and I had trouble doing that because most of them were a little bit skeptical about what the hurry was. Well, there was no hurry except we wanted to get married. And uh, so it was just the four of us and uh, Gwen had a camera with her that, uh, as it turned out, the batteries didn't work so there were no photographs of this, this big wedding. Um, and all these many years later, during those years, you all had three children. Yes. Our first daughter, Mary Alice, was born in January 1977. You were born in September of 78. And our youngest daughter, Kara, was born in October 1980. I think you got that right. Thankfully. Um, and what about grandkids? We are very blessed to have numerous grandchildren. We, uh, we have 10 grandchildren now. Um, Mary Alice has three from her first marriage, but she recently remarried, and her husband had two young boys, Nico and Luca, and they are now our grandsons. You have three wonderful children, and Kara has three, uh, two wonderful children. Uh, and anybody who has seen your office knows that 
it's almost a shrine to your grandkids. Well, they, uh, whatever you've heard about being a grandparent is absolutely true. It's the most fantastic experience you could ever have. It's, it's just a delight to see them grow and learn and, um, and not be responsible for them. Mm -hmm. And I take every opportunity to spoil them when I can. That is true. <laughs> okay, when you joined Kramer Racing in October of 1974, what do you remember about the types of, of cases you were given to work on or asked to help with? At first, uh, I was given a variety of things. Of course, I had no clue uh, really what was involved in the practice of law. I knew there was criminal law and civil law. That's about the extent of what I knew. Um, and I was given a variety of things, but fairly early on, um, I began to work more with Andy Johnson, who did civil litigation and his primary client was Tennessee Farmers Mutual Insurance Company. And uh, Tennessee Farmers became a client of the firm in the very early 1950s, and they are still a client of this firm. So I began to work more with Andy Johnson than with anyone else, and of course at the beginning that involved a lot of subrogation work, a lot of General Sessions Court work. I uh, would attend depositions with Mr. Johnson and uh, sit with him at trial occasionally, although not, not as often as I probably should have. Uh, he was not the greatest mentor in the world and I picked up that trait from him. Um, but he was a mentor in the sense that it, simply by watching him and watching him interact with people and watching him interact with juries, I learned a lot. Do you remember your first jury trial? I do. Uh, I'm not sure the firm was aware that I tried this first jury trial by myself and had no one with me. Uh, I suspect had that been known, maybe someone would have gone with me, but it was for a uh, ride or truck. It was a minor property damage case where the issue was uh, a tractor trailer had backed into a loading dock and the issue was whether the damage that had been done was cosmetic or whether it had done any structural damage. And so not a lot of money involved, but I went down there and tried the case myself. And um, now I had watched some jury trials. Whenever I had a few minutes, I would go to the courthouse, watch good lawyers try cases. We had a set of books called trial trial practice or trial techniques. Uh, I studied those books quite a bit, uh, but I was pretty much on my own on that first jury trial. I learned a couple of things from that trial. One is don't put your elbows on the judge's bench. Uh, judge Haynes let me know pretty quickly that was not appropriate. And secondly, I learned to pay attention to what's going on uh, in jury selection and throughout the trial. Listen. One of the potential jurors was an insurance adjuster. And as we were selecting the jury, I'm thinking, hey, that might be someone I might like to have on the jury. But surely the plaintiff's lawyer will strike him. Well, he didn't. And so I ended up with an insurance adjuster on the jury. And I learned it was pretty important to pay attention to everything going on in the courtroom and not put my elbows on the judge's bench. So you haven't done that again? Well, I can't say that I haven't, but um, I've always apologized after I've done it. Uh, do you remember any other early cases? Oh, yes. Um, you may be referring to um, an incident where Hugh Morgan was a lawyer with the Kramer firm, and Hugh went on uh, a two-week leave for National Guard duty. And he left two or three files on my desk and gave me some instructions about you know, what might happen or what might not happen while he was on uh, National Guard duty. And one of the files involved a uh, medical clinic. And he said, I'm not sure that anything will happen while I'm gone, but, but keep your eye on this. Well, I got a frantic call one day that this medical clinic um, 
was being uh, tossed out on the street, basically. Uh, failure to pay rent or something, and the sheriff's office was at this clinic um, hauling out furniture, bringing out patients onto the street. I had no clue what to do. I was very young, not much experience, and so I decided the best thing to do would be to run to Irma Greenwood's office. Irma was a fantastic lawyer, um, and she was always willing to help and to listen, and I sat down with Irma and told her what my problem was, and she uh, jumped up and agreed to help me. Um, I don't remember everything that happened, but I do remember being uh, at the scene of this event with television cameras, and instead of holding Irma's briefcase, I was holding Irma's purse while she uh, tried to take care of what was going on. And people around here have never let me forget about that. Uh, another early experience that I had, probably within the first year of practice, I got sent up to um, maybe Hamblin County to represent a plaintiff whose house or barn had burned and Fireman's Fund, I think, was the insurance carrier. They had denied coverage and alleged that my client had burned it. Well, there was no evidence of that, or so I thought. And we went up to try the case, and <clears throat> excuse me. before the case started, uh, the opposing lawyer advised the judge that there had been a, been a big development overnight, that a couple of witnesses had been granted immunity from prosecution and that they were prepared to testify that my client had hired them to burn this structure. That was quite uh, upsetting and surprising and I didn't really know what to do. Um, I, um, the judge suggested that uh, why don't you just take their depositions right now? And of course not knowing any better, um, I took their depositions in the open courtroom, and it was Judge Hull who later became the federal judge, and I took brief depositions of both of these witnesses who confirmed that my client had hired them to burn this structure. And I asked Judge Hull if I could have a short recess, and I remember taking my client out into a side office, and I said two things. Number one, we need to take a non-suit. Number two, we need to get the hell out of town. <laughs> But, um, so we went back in, I announced to the court that we were taking a non-suit, and the judge said, well, unfortunately, um, based on what I've heard, I've got no choice but to issue a bench warrant, and my client was arrested and taken to jail immediately. And so I went to Morristown expecting to get a large verdict against an insurance company and ended up leaving town with my client in jail. So that was, that was a learning experience as well. Well, and uh, as it turns out, representing insurance companies became the, the mark of your career, insurance companies and their insureds. Tell us how you came to be the, the fundamental uh, insurance defense lawyer. Well, uh, Mr. Johnson, as I mentioned earlier, represented Tennessee Farmers, and uh, the firm represented some other insurance clients. But most of my work uh, was with Mr. Johnson uh, in representing Tennessee Farmers policyholders and in representing the company itself when, when that need came up. And um, I also learned that I was not very adept at any other area of the law. I, I really enjoyed doing this insurance defense work. And very in the early 1980s, Mr. Johnson became ill. And he had a tremendous caseload. And um, you know, I had worked with him some, but there were not many files where I had sole responsibility. But suddenly, uh, Mr. Johnson was not able to work, and we had all these cases. A lot of them set for trial. And when I look back on it, I'm really amazed, but number one, the firm had the confidence in me to allow me to continue to handle those cases, although I had very little experience. 
but even more surprisingly, Tennessee farmers um, had trust in me and did not object to my handling those cases. And it was just a great uh, act of trust on both the firm's part and Tennessee farmer's part. So I became very busy all of a sudden and I learned on the fly. Uh, one of the first cases that I handled after Mr. Johnson became ill was a death case, wrongful death case that Sid Gilreath, a well-known, wonderful Knoxville attorney, uh, was on the other side. And uh, we tried this case and I was fortunate enough to get a defense verdict. So I learned by doing and I think that is the best way to learn, although maybe it's a little easier if you gradually get into it. Um, and what, what is it like to be charged with the responsibility to be defending these people uh, in, in matters that give them great concern? Well, I take my responsibility very seriously and my responsibility is to the client and in most cases that client is the policyholder. The insurance company pays me um, but my client is my first and primary responsibility and in many cases they are sued for an amount that are greater than their insurance coverage and it's a terrifying experience for them and many times it's terrifying for me because it's a great responsibility to have people's personal assets in your hands. Um, but, I, and I know that the clients are very nervous and worried about it from day one. And from my very first encounter with them, I try to get them to relax a little bit, but, but to keep in mind that, you know, that there, are, but there is a potential uh, that a verdict could exceed the policy limits. Uh, but it's a great, great, great responsibility and uh, many times that responsibility requires me to advise the insurance company to do something they really don't want to do. And the wonderful thing about Tennessee Farmers is they understand who my client is. They always have and they always will. They're a great company to do work for and they never question uh, any tactic like that. And if, if I recommend something that's on behalf of their policyholder, they agree to it because they know where my first responsibility is. Um, and you know, an interesting part of your practice is that because you are representing individuals who are being assigned to you, um, a lot of times there are acts of gratitude from them that, that come out of a good result. There are, um, and, and it's especially nice to get a, a thank you from someone after, after a trial. Um, just this past Christmas, I received a huge basket from a client who had minimal insurance limits, but the claim against him was a very serious claim, and luckily we were able to get it resolved within his limits, and he was very grateful for what I was able to do for him. Uh, I remember one time a very particularly intense trial where my client's personal assets were at stake and it was maybe a two-day trial. We were fortunate enough to win and we're walking up the street afterwards and my client said, I was just praying that the jury would do the right thing. I said, well, not me. I was praying we'd win. <laughs> uh, you have tried a lot of cases. Do you have an estimate on how many cases you've tried? My best guess is around 350 jury trials. Um, I, I started a list at some point and I have that list at home somewhere. Uh, it was well over 300 when I stopped um, compiling the list. And one of the reasons I stopped is, is because there are not that many trials these days. Uh, the number of jury trials is dramatically down from historic highs. Um, it's just very unusual now to see a case go all the way to a jury trial. Um, t 
tell us about spending time in front of the circuit judges, both in Knox and in the surrounding counties? I'm now really on my third generation of judges in Knox County. Originally, it was Judge Chester Mahood, Judge T. Edward Cole, Judge Jim Haynes, and then what I call the second generation was Judge Dale Workman, Judge Harold Wimberly, and Judge uh, Wheeler Rosenbaum. And now, First Circuit, Judge Christy Davis, Judge Bill Ayler in Second Circuit, and Judge Debbie Stevens in Third Circuit. And they have all been great judges. Uh, I cannot imagine how it would have been to practice law in some other areas of the state. Knox County has always been blessed with wonderful, wonderful judges. Um, and that makes it so much easier. Judges in other counties, I've run across some wonderful judges, maybe some not so wonderful, but I can't say that I ever overtly felt like I was treated as an out-of-towner. Um, I always felt like I got a fair shake, um, but we have had some fantastic judges in Knox County and still do. Do you remember your record for the number of jury trials in a week or a month or a day? Well, I've had the unusual experience of trying two jury trials in one day. Um, I had some a two jury trials set in Granger County, and I knew in the weeks leading up uh, to the trial date that I had both sets set, but I assumed that at some point the trial judge, Judge Rex Henry Ogle, would tell us which case was going to go to trial. Well, it was a false assumption. A few days before trial, uh, he let me know that he expected the parties to be ready for both cases. And so we went to Granger County, tried the first jury trial. Now, these were not complicated cases. They were automobile accident cases. And the first one was over by noon, 12.30 thereabouts. And we started the second one 30 minutes later with some of the same people on the jury as had sat on the first trial. Um, I got a very good result on the first trial. The second one was one I wasn't very pleased with. And Judge Ogle loves to tell that story. In fact, about six months ago, I was at a docket sounding um, where he was presiding, and he asked for my permission to tell the audience about that experience. And I said, well, Judge, you're going to tell it anyway, so you might as well go ahead. But he told, uh, he told the audience about uh, that experience, and he also mentioned that I had filed a motion for a new trial um, over the case that didn't turn out as well. And I won't use the words that were mentioned uh, when he overruled it, but uh, it was quite colorful, and he enjoyed telling the story. When you go into a courtroom and represent your client, many times, sometimes many times, uh, you are on the other side against lawyers who may be excellent friends of yours. And I think there are some people that may not understand how that's possible. So tell us about those rela your relationships with other lawyers, and particularly those who are plaintiff's lawyers. Well. I try my best to get along with everyone. I have several plaintiff's lawyers who are friends. I'm afraid to name them because I'll leave out someone, but some wonderful friends, fantastic lawyers, lawyers who are of the highest uh, ethical, uh, have the highest ethical standards. And, uh, but that lawyer will do his or her job as best they can for their client, and I'm going to do the best I can for my client. And there have been many times that I've told my clients, I'm going to tell you right now up front that I know this attorney, and I know him or her very well. I've known them for years. He or she, is a, they're great attorneys. They're honest. They're ethical. If you expect me to say something bad about them or to treat them badly or try to do something that's not right, I'm not going to do it. They're my friends now. They'll always be my friends. We will work hard to win the case, and he'll do his best to win his case, but they're not bad people, and you need to know that.
And sometimes, um, you know, your clients want you to act like the other attorney is a villain, and I simply won't do that. You remember a time where you had a jury trial the next day and uh, got asked to do something socially the night before? <laughs> I was sitting in my office late one afternoon and the late, great Zane Daniel called me and invited me to dinner at Copper Cellar. And then he wanted me to go with him to a UT basketball game. And I said, Zane, I'm sorry, but I've it sounds great, but I've got a trial tomorrow. I said, in fact, it's against your brother Creed. It's in the Granger County Chancery Court. And Zane's response was, well, hell, Creed will be at the game. <laughs> so I sat with Creed at the basketball game uh, the night before we teed it up in front of Chancellor Rainwater. And that's not an abnormal experience. No. Uh, you know, if, if you're a friend of mine, you're a friend. And Again, I'm going to do my best. I expect the other person to do their best. But I, you're not going to be my enemy because we're in a lawsuit. I've had a lot of people say to me, both as part of this process and, and many times over the years, I don't know what it is about Tom, but juries just love him. He, he, they, they believe him. He's just so likable. Why do you think, why do you think juries like you? Well, I don't know whether juries like me or not. What I know is you need to be yourself. And I've never tried to be anything other than myself. I can't stand up and give a spellbinding closing argument. Never have been able to do that, never will be able to. And I, and I tell new lawyers, don't try to copy someone else, just be yourself. I do feel it's important to be honest with juries. And I think if you're honest with them, they will like you. If you acknowledge that you have some weak spots in your case, you tell them that as early and as often as you can. And I think juries appreciate lawyers being honest because you know, with the reputation that lawyers have, not deserved, by the way, but uh, with that kind of reputation, I think lawyers appreciate it when, when well, juries appreciate it if lawyers are honest with them. And you just try to treat people with respect all witnesses, the court, and if you do that, it's likely that people will like you. Um, you know, you, you said you would tell the jurors both the good and the bad about your case. It, as part of your preparation, do you develop a story or a theme you want them to believe? Well, I th think that it's always important to have a theme. And you stick to that theme when possible. I've had some cases where I was simply not able to develop a theme, and you're simply a sitting duck when you don't have a theme. Uh, you're at the jury's mercy. But whatever that theme is, you need to stick with it. And almost always, there's some theme. Yes, it, it can be a, a pre-existing condition or or something, but usually there's something that you need to continue to emphasize throughout the trial. If I'm doing the math correctly, you've been at Kramer Racing for 40, 45 years, um, which is a long time. That it is. T tell me about your relationships with your partners at Kramer Racing and the people at Kramer Racing. You know, it, they are my family. They have been my family since the first day I walked in. Um, They're wonderful people. I c could not have worked in a better environment. It would just have been impossible. Now, we, with as many attorneys as we have, we have sharp differences of opinions about things sometimes. Politically, we're probably 50-50. But the remarkable thing is that we can remain friends even if we disagree vehemently about political matters or political issues. Um, everyone here has always been like my brother or my sister. And, uh, and that includes people on the staff. We, we view the staff as our family. And um, that's been one of the most pleasurable things about 
the practice of all. You've been given a number of honors over a number of years. Is there some accomplishment or honor that you would say means the most to you? Well, about four years ago, I was elected as a fellow in the American College of Trial Lawyers, and um, that is an organization that uh, includes, I think, less than 1% of the attorneys in any state. And that was a great honor to be elected to that group, and I, th I think that's the, the highest honor uh, that I've ever had. What else do you wish I had asked or that you would like to tell us? Well, number one, I could not have practiced law or tried as many cases as I have without the full support of your mother and my wife, Deborah. Uh, she has um, endured a lot because I, I work hard and I work long hours and I work on weekends, but I could not have accomplished anything you know, without her support. Um, the other thing is, I think attorneys get a, a terrible, there's a terrible disservice to attorneys. They are among the most honorable people that I work with day in and day out. And it irritates me to no end when I hear people make remarks about attorneys. I would, most of the attorneys I deal with, I would trust with my life or my bank account. Um, and it's so unfair to, for attorneys to have poor reputations. The other thing that I might mention is practicing law in Knoxville. It's different than practicing in other cities in this state. We have a group of people who work well with one another. We don't do things by surprise. We don't do things typically by notice. Uh, everyone, for the most part, gets along. And I cannot imagine practicing in an environment where you don't have that uh, camaraderie as we have here in the Knoxville Bar. What would you tell a new lawyer about how to learn to be a trial lawyer given what we all know, which is that not as many cases are going to trial. What would you tell them about how to, how to create themselves as a trial lawyer? Well, that's difficult because um, there are not nearly as many jury trials now as there were. It was not infrequent to walk down to the courthouse on any given day and there be jury trials in all three of our circuit courts. That was not unusual at all. And so there were many opportunities for young attorneys to go down and sit and watch a trial. I, I would simply encourage young lawyers now to go as often as they can to watch trials, although, again, the, the opportunities are limited. Um, but you're not going to develop into a trial lawyer by sitting in your office filing motions and uh, you know, arguing about various things that way. Um, but it is, it is more difficult than it was when I was growing up. I would encourage young lawyers to do sessions court work because you have to think on your feet in sessions court. You're, you're you know, in circuit court, obviously you've taken depositions and you're more prepared, but it is helpful to learn how to think on your feet and you can acquire some of those skills in general sessions court. And there are a lot more general sessions court trials than there are jury trials anymore. A lot of people um, are bemoaning the fact that there are fewer jury trials. You know, I'm not going to question someone if they want to resolve their claim. Um, and if people want to settle their claims, fine. But you don't have the opportunities that you once did uh, to hone your skills by trying cases. And to that extent, the lack of jury trials now is a, you know, it's a thing that is a little disconcerting. But I'm not going to criticize anybody if they want to settle their case. And mediation, of course, has done, has been the biggest factor in that. What else do you think has changed 
in the practice of law from, you know, in your first 10 years versus now? Well, of course, the, the jury trial issue is the number one, I think. But secondly, technology. There's just no comparison between the technology, technology that's available now as compared to when I first started practicing. I don't think sticky notes had been invented when I started. Um, we had an old switchboard where the operator would physically pull plugs in and plug them. Um, I fear, however, that technology has become the end rather than the means to an end. There are lots of great technological advancements that have been very helpful to the practice of law. But again, I fear that we may be macing, uh, placing more emphasis on technology than we are on the actual underlying case. Um, obviously, it's better now to be able for a jury to be able to see a photograph all at one time by looking at a screen, as opposed to the days when you stood by a witness and holding a photograph and hoping that someone at the end of the jury box might be able to see it. There are obvious things that are so much more helpful now. But the, the, you know, those changes are just dramatic. Um, I could leave the office and drive to Sevier County for a trial or a docket sounding or a motion, not hear anything from anyone until I got back to the office and maybe have a stack of pink slips. But now you're bombarded with texts and emails and faxes at all times and all hours of the night. I get emails at 3 a.m. Um, that, I, I'm not sure that's good. I remember my late great friend Paul Dunn told me one time that when he gets a fax, he said, when I get a fax, I don't immediately place that above anything else that I've got to do. I put it in line with everything else. And just because you faxed it to me doesn't mean it's any more important in my life. That reminds me of something I meant to ask you about earlier. You, you told me a story about when we were talking about mentoring young lawyers and, and uh, getting them trained. You told me a story the other day about Paul Dunn. It was probably with a, within a month or two after I became licensed. Uh, a friend of mine in Johnson City had a client who needed an uncontested divorce. And she was from Upper East Tennessee, and so he asked me if I would go with her to that final hearing where the uncontested divorce would be granted. I said, sure, I probably can't foul that up. Although I did know nothing about family law. Uh, so we go to the courthouse and we go to the courtroom and this particular judge um, had some, I'm going to say idiosyncrasies about what questions needed to be asked in order to attain a, a divorce. And I didn't ask those questions in the proper way. And instead of assisting me, this judge um, in front of the entire courtroom, which was packed, said, I'm going to send you out in the hall where you can figure out what, what the proper questions are. So after being thoroughly embarrassed by the court, I walked out in the hall. Of course, the client's not thrilled either. Uh, but I walked out in the hall, and this giant of a man walked up and introduced himself to me, said, I'm Paul Dunn. And Paul explained to me what I needed to ask this witness in order to comply with what the judge was looking for. And I never, ever forgot Paul's graciousness. Uh, and that's what Knoxville lawyers do. And that's what I've enjoyed about practicing law. And Paul was my friend from that moment on. And the moral of that story would be for experienced lawyers to do this. If same. you see someone in need, you step up and help out. We're all better off when that happens. My final question to you is how would you like to be remembered? 
Well, I would like to be remembered as someone who worked hard, who did his very best for his clients, who was honest, ethical. Um, I think I have a reputation that I'm honest and can be trusted, and that's a reputation I'd like to have. I, I don't particularly need to be re uh, remembered for any great accomplishments in the courtroom. I've had my share of wins, I've had my share of losses. But I would like to be remembered as someone you could trust and someone who did the things the right way. And I've been fortunate to practice with people who do things the right way. And I was taught well, and I hope I can teach others to do it the right way.